Theology Podcast, where we equip leaders to think biblically, reflect theologically, and act missionally. Today we begin an extension series, I guess we'll call it, in just two parts before we, we break for the summertime. Case studies that flow out of our biblical theology of mission that we developed over the last numerous episodes. Um, but first, before we get there, when this episode is released, we, Tyler, co-host here, yeah, and, and I, Sean, will be at our final missional retreat of the year with Four Mission College. So tell us what we're going to do, Tyler. So missional retreat is our uh, opportunity to kind of take our students either into a new cross-cultural environment where they can practice what they're learning in the classroom or to take them away to rest and reflect and be with the father and also be with each other just as we see Jesus doing Jesus is uh, in his ministry was was going into new places and uh, engaging with people from different backgrounds and different uh, cultural uh, yeah, cultures, but then he was also pulling away and spending time with his father in desolate places, uh, even in the midst of the craziness. So we want to do that with our students. And at this retreat, we're really going to be looking back at the whole last year. Uh, and especially we're looking forward to hearing from our third year students who are going to be graduating this, this year, uh, hearing kind of advice from them to their underclassmen. That's going to be great. It'll be great. Looking forward to that time. And, and also, and also just looking ahead to what God has for us. So we'll be uh, at our conference center in Malonavice in the Czech Republic. And, um, so you could be, even if you're listening to this on Tuesday, uh, then you could be praying for us. Yeah, that would be excellent as we are in those, those beautiful mountains here in the Czech Republic. Um, and, and, yeah, so if we could summarize what we do in those missional retreats, it's basically practicing missional rest, missional presence. That's right. So we, we're not just talking in a vacuum at, 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 on this podcast. It's a, that's a direct outlet where we're, we're practicing. And we've gotten some really strong feedback um, from these practices that we're, we're developing as part of our campus, which is amazing. Um, and if you're interested, just by the way, for those watching on YouTube, I'm, I'm looking at you. Um, those who are listening, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you. <laughs> we have uh, applications open. So you can go to formission.org.uk. And then at the top in the, the, the scroll bar, you can click BA and then click apply in the drop down menu. And that will take you to the, the application. So without further ado, we'll, we'll jump right in. Today, we begin with perhaps the most obvious outflow of a missional, uh, I'm sorry, biblical theology of mission, evangelism. That's yeah, seems to be a given, and I think that this is this is why there's often so much focus on doing, like the missional task is there, it's present. Yeah, because um, people need to hear the gospel, so there's work to be done, important work to be done. And the, yes, <laughs> hallelujah, amen. This is true, um, but we we must not neglect being also, uh, because it's it, it's the foundation of our doing. Like, like, was it James? That we should be hearers and doers of the word. Um, so hearing it with this, that in, in, involved in that is necessarily slowing down, stopping to, to have Selah, <laughs> to, to rest, uh, to pause, um, that we don't want to miss. So today, w- maybe Tyler, can, do you think we can use the term, uh, maybe this is pushing the boundary too much, so you let me know. Can okay, we use okay. the term missional evangelism? Or is that like an oxymoron? It doesn't... <laughs> Well, it all depends on how you define missional. So I think that could be a really helpful, helpful kind of uh, corrective or nuance of, of evangelism. Um, if we take this kind of embodied, um, like the people of God embodying the presence of God uh, as, a, as a central part of mission, as we discovered in our biblical theology of mission, if we combine that with evangelism, which is good newsing, uh, sharing the good news. Good newsing. I love that. <laughs> Do you like that? So I think that this this could work. This could be this could be good. That's a, that'll be our new tagline coming back in the fall. Maybe we're we're we're, we're good newsing. Um, you know, connecting theology and other things. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll work on that. Over okay, the great, great. That'll be great. Um, yeah, and, and I'll, I'll leave names out of it for this example. Um, but I have a very specific example in mind of. I know somebody who was talking about somebody else that they disciple about evangelism. Mm. And it was just uh, a, from within a, a, a Bible study they were doing. And this person who's discipling the other simply said, 
wait, it, like in, in their mind, we're, we're talking about evangelism, but like our application is very general. We're not talking specifically enough. Mm. So this person asked the question. So person, person I'm discipling, I won't name who are you evangelizing or, or working towards evangelizing right now? And the person was like, whoa, like we're talking about evangelism, mm. but I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that. And so like we, I, I think in that aspect, asking a question like that, we, we should in some sense think about evangelism in a missional sense. Yeah. Uh, so we don't forget to ask those very concrete um, questions that are, they're not theoretical. They're, they're literally a call to be on mission. Um, I think also we can certainly affirm that mission in the Bible includes evangelism. It does. I mean, that it, just to make it explicit, it should go without being said. Um, the question, though, becomes what kind of evangelism? Some say it's it's purely relational. Mm. We'll let them know by our actions, and, you know, eventually maybe we'll get around to it. Um, like that dreaded phrase that was never said, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, necessary use words. It was never said. Attributed to so many different people. No, no, no. Um, but it... it, it Fictitious Somebody said it, but n- not not the important people in church history that they're attributed to. Yeah, and others others are. Um, you may we may have a picture in your mind with this one specifically. Say that we must use only words mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and and forget some of the other aspect. And I think that there's a huge uh, 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 chasm, a uh, gap in between these two. What do we want to call them? Views or, or uh, methods for doing evangelism. Uh, so. To be consistent, I, I think, well, first, we, we've discussed the idea of, of relational presence of God and how mission and, and Israel was to attract the nations through a missional holiness, which is then thrust outward as Jesus pulls in close and then thrust the disciples out to be missional presence in the world. To be consistent, we're striving to do this anyway, yeah, to yes. be consistent with our interpretation of our developed theology of mission we need to include holiness Mm -hmm. in the topic of evangelism. So something like being plus words equals strong evangelism. I'm I'm not strong in math, so that's not, (laughs) it's it's a a simple formula. We did not. Yeah. Yeah. We, we chose a different path than math, but we can still use logic. Oh, excellent segue. (laughs) I'm, I'm thankful to those who do know math because we have, Hey, some students at Formation, they're, they're more geared that direction. And what they come up with is, is can be brilliant sometimes. And, and just because of how they're thinking more mathematically. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if we think about it, <clears throat> excuse me, and being in, in attempting to be consistent with, with words and action, uh, yeah, words, action, and, and our presence, um, we have to think about the question, how do people in Central and Eastern Europe come to faith? What do you think, Tyler? In general, like if we can stereotype. Yeah. Uh, definitely through um, Facebook debates. Oh. That's the, that's the main way. Yeah, you just like, you, you, you find people who said something stupid and then you just destroy it. And that's definitely the way. No. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> No, the number one way that uh, the the most prevalent way that people come to faith in this part of the world is through uh, through through relationship and through personal experience um, of a transformed life by Christ. Um, so there's lots of lots of stories. Um, one of my favorites is um, uh, a girl that I grew up with in. Um, I, maybe I've shared this on the podcast before, but um, a girl who I, I grew up with in in uh, in high school who came to a camp and uh, was like, why is everybody being so nice to me? Like, sure that yeah, they have yeah, another yeah. agenda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and it was through observing them and watching them uh, love one another uh, that then the words of the gospel were able to, to sink in. So that's one of my favorite examples, but I've seen lots of other examples like this before as well, uh, where people get a taste of the gospel uh, along with the words of the gospel. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Yeah. And so, I mean, yeah, not, not many people would say something like, I thought and logic led me to Jesus. Some people do those. Some people do. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh, that's, that's probably the most log- and, it, and, and it is logical. Uh, Christianity and the gospel does make sense. 
But uh, that's not the main way, at least in this part of the world, that, that people come to Jesus. Yeah, it seems like, and just for, for my involvement with, with uh, English camps, with Josiah Adventure in the past, most people seem to say, I watched that person, like what you were saying, or, or that group of people, usually that group of people, that youth group, that, that those people at camp, whatever. And, and I liked what they, I liked what they had. I didn't know what it was at the time, but I was drawn to it. Yeah. The only difference I could find was that they, they talk about this dude named Jesus all the time. And so I wanted what they had and I placed my faith in Jesus leading us to the question. All right. Do, do you think that this, this, uh, second view that we're talking about now, they, they watched somebody's life and came to faith. Do you think that's anti-intellectual and therefore the need for theological education goes out the window? Ooh, wow. You just escalated that real quick. <laughs> I like to, it's fun. So, um, no, I don't think so because the way that we reflect on about who God is, um, and about the, the, the truth of the gospel and the truth of, of scripture, uh, it informs the way that we live. So things like holiness, uh, we might have no idea how holiness, how important holiness is unless we actually start to reflect on a biblical theology of mission. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so it's, it's, it's that reflection and, um, and thinking and learning that actually informs um, how, how we live out our Christian faith in a way that is attractive to others. Yeah, and we, and we just think in the, in, in the text of the Bible, since you mentioned biblical theology of mission again, Jesus spent a lot of time with the disciples teaching them so that their, their words and their life would become the foundation for many, many other people to come to faith. That's right. And so people saw how they were interacting in the world, um, but it's because of what they learned. And so there's, there's no, I, I just get the sense that sometimes there's this uh, relational evangelism and therefore I don't need theological education um, types of sentiment or thoughts happen. And I just don't think it's fair because what informs how a person acts? Well, who, who they're spending their time with. That's right. Who they look up to, who they listen to. I mean, one of the main uh, uh, names that Jesus' disciples gave to Jesus was rabbi. So, teacher. Teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and not just uh, not just uh, a, a teacher who's uh, um, giving a lecture. That's right. Yeah, but more like facilitating, which mm -hmm. is why we do what we do at Four Mission College and other things. Yes, I'm going to yeah. pause myself and <laughs> say because yes. it's, it's a little irrelevant to this. Uh, but the idea is someone who comes to faith by, by watching the life of others is actually learning theology. I mean, I, I'm convinced that that's true. They saw a picture of God. So the, a Andrew Hardy, uh, the research director for Four Mission College, uh, wrote a book called Pictures of God where he talks about this. We've mentioned it before on the podcast. Um, they saw a picture of God in the life of the Christian and they chose to believe. So what, what governs the, the character in life of, of that Christian is the theology that they're implicitly, not knowingly or explicitly knowingly living out in that way. I think theology is, is it's truly the, the, the foundation <laughs> of, of our missional evangelism, truly the, the environment from which mission is accomplished. Mission is done. That's right. If you'll allow me to return to something important from Absolutely. our, Probably, I think our very first episode where we talked about the, the purpose of theology, we, uh, we kind of landed on a definition of theology by Michael Bird. Hello, YouTubers. You can see the book right here. Right. Um, for the, for those listening, it's a thick book, Michael Bird, Evangelical Theology. Blue it's in cover. second edition. We need to get the second edition. But um, just a reminder, this is the kind of definition for theology that we, we really liked. Um, uh, Michael Bird says that theology is the attempt to verbalize and to perform our relationship with God. Uh, that could also be a definition for evangelism. <laughs> I mean, to verbalize mm -hmm. and to perform. There's some speaking that needs to be done, and there's also some living that needs to be done, some embodying. And so, we're talking about missional presence now. Missional presence, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so, um, theology is not uh, just an exercise for the intellectuals in in their high towers, but it's actually something that informs the way that we share the gospel with others. 
Yeah, that's excellent to be, to bring in Michael Bird there. That's uh, was that from our first episode? I think very I think first episode. Back yeah. from our first episode, we're we're reminiscing a little bit here today oh, in this podcast. Yes. <laughs> We've come a long way since come, episode one. Come a long way. And uh, we're, I think we're enjoying it even more. Um, so hopefully you who are watching, you who are listening, are, are enjoying along with us. Um, so done rightly, this can make evangelism stronger. The idea of performing. We think, oh, performing. If we're an audience, what do we see? We see people uh, acting on the stage. Mm. But those people had a lot of stuff to do behind the scenes, like literally behind oh, the yeah. curtain. Yeah. And, and weeks, uh, a, a long time before, I was, I've was i been a part of a musical, oh. believe it or not. Wow, I had uh, no idea. I, I even did some improvisation um, as a like a, an act when I was in high school, believe it or not. Oh, I, I never goodness. talked in high school, hardly, but somehow I did this. Um, it's really fun, part of a, a musical. Um, and we spent a lot of time rehearsing. And... I'm just going to think about it now. I had to memorize songs. So I had a CD to guys and dolls, the musical it's, it's actually quite enjoyable. Um, I'm not recommending you watch it per se, but <laughs> uh, I know I don't have a recording just in case anybody's wondering oh, in the background here. Um, people are going to go searching for YouTube now. Sean Smith, guys and dolls. There are probably other Sean Smiths though. So yeah, they're probably better actors, <laughs> <laughs> but we, sp- I, I had to spend a lot of time listening to that CD and it literally was shaped who I was for a period of time because I'm trying to memorize, but it gets yep. stuck in your head. And so I'm singing these songs when I'm sitting in, in math class, you know, or uh, uh, other classes. Um, and, and the idea of performance, there, there's more going on than meets the eye. It's, it's more than just the act of doing. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of presence. There's a lot of being that goes into it uh, in order to make the, the actual performance more. What's the right word I'm looking more, for? More. Uh, yeah. Meaningful uh, is all me- I'm thinking of. Yeah. Something like this. So maybe let's move now to take a closer look at a missional type of relational evangelism. Um, relationship that involves presence, involves performance. And, and not, um, not performance in the sense of if I do the right things, then people will come to faith. Um, it's, not, it's not a magic formula and it's not... Uh, it's also not like putting on a... Putting on a, putting on a show is, is a way of manipulation. It's, the, yes, it's a way yes. of embodying, embodying, uh, our faith essentially and making it, making it more visible. That's something we always need help with. Yeah. So for those, those who are, are watching, you can see, but I, I've just pulled off, uh, for those of you listening, Dr. Robert E. Coleman's book, a little, little text called the master plan of evangelism. Hopefully you can see that on, on YouTube here. They put, they put doctor on the cover. So now, you know, it's a serious book it, or, or they're trying to cover up an insecurity or something. I, why do they, why do we do this? Like theological books, especially like when you get published, you have to do your initials and, and somehow that gives you more distinction. Hmm. I, I don't get it, but it's part of the, it's part of how it goes. So what am I? I can't shorten my name. S Smith. <laughs> that, that doesn't work. S M Smith. That doesn't work either. It sounds weird. T J is it your middle name, James? Yeah, uh, uh, Joseph. Joseph. Yes, so yes, yes. TJ, Patty. That, yes. that, that flows a little better. Oh, thank you. Back to the point. Robert Coleman, on, on page 14, he talks about evangelism, of course, but he's talking about form following function. So I'm going to read this paragraph, then we can interact with it. He says, concern at this point immediately focuses the need for a well-thought-through strategy of movement day by day in terms of the long-range goal. We must know how a course of action fits into the overall plan God has for our lives if it is to thrill our souls, imagination, with a sense of destiny. This is true of any particular procedure or technique employed to propagate or further the gospel. Just as a building is constructed according to the plan for its use, so everything we do must have a purpose. Otherwise, our activity can be lost in aimlessness and confusion. What do you think, Tyler? Well, it's interesting you said that, uh, you know, buildings need a plan, but that plan is actually, uh, is it, the plan is not the ultimate goal. <laughs> it's, it's like a waypoint between the, the purpose, as you said, and the expected outcome. And right. so uh, I think a lot of times we focus on just the plan 
as or the method as the end. Like if I do this, 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 then we're good. Then I did what I was supposed to, but not thinking maybe a little bit less about, okay, what is actually the purpose behind me sharing my faith? And what do I actually hope will happen in the life of this person? What is God already doing uh, in them, through them, around them? And how can I better move in that direction? Uh, I think that, so, so you, the, the form has to follow the, the purpose uh, and take into account the expected outcome or the hoped for outcome. Yeah, exactly. I was, I'm, I'm short. So I was trying to reach that upper level there to put the book back. Uh, for those of you who like, why is it paused right now? Um, it's because I'm short, but form following function. It definitely. So, and I think to even take a step back more into the abstract realm for a moment, Thinking yep. of in th- in, in Take us there, Sean. Truth proposition. Um, yes. So step one flows into step two, and therefore step three, uh, that kind of thing. So there, there are different levels of argument that we need to be aware of. I think that we need to know in order for our form to, to actually flow and, and, and lead to function. So the heart of this is to understand the word semiotics, which Tyler quickly describe the word semiotics. We don't care if you remember the word semiotics, but what, what the, what it means is, is useful. So semiotics is how, how words function essentially. Yeah. So how words fit together and to produce meaning. I mean, I, I, I let you do it because what, well, for those of you who don't know, part of Tyler's PhD, uh, he's a PhD candidate at Cambridge and that's part in part what he's yeah. doing, what he's studying in the old Testament. So he's, well fit for this, this, this discussion. Uh, and one, one feature though of, of semiotics is that words are, are vehicles that convey meaning. Yeah. Words correspond to pictures. We actually think in pictures. We don't think in words. Um, so we, we don't conceive of things with words. There's, there's always a, a correlating picture in our minds. So one thing semiotics can help us to understand is to better conceptualize an evangelistic conversation. So we have a believer Person B, a non, non-believer, seeker, whatever we want to say. And then C, which would be the gospel itself. So C is the truth of the gospel. And Tyler, what, there's a lot going on. If we think of it in terms of yeah. in this conversation where I'm A, A you're B, factors. we're talking about C. What, <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> oh, oh, nothing. It's, it's really pretty straightforward. No, but like A, as the believer... I, okay, put myself in that, in that, in that position. I have some experiences. I have some knowledge. I have some background. I have some presuppositions as well. I have some cultural background, some, I have an identity. I have things that are important to me and less important. I am trying to relate to you. (laughs) You have those same, same, same issues going on. You have a background, you have culture, you have some presuppositions, some pre-understanding, you have some knowledge about and experience. You and about C. That's right. That's right. Mm-hmm. So, so we might have a relationship. Um, we might not. And, uh, you might look at me and, and say, Oh, Tyler's wearing a blue shirt. I hate blue shirts. And then you're going to not, not like what I'm saying just based on, because I don't like, because you don't like blue shirts. No, I don't, that's a little extreme, but there's these kind of things that, 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 that are going on. Um, if we talk about even language background, mm. there are things that I might say that are clear to me that, as you mentioned, paint a clear picture in my head, but that means something totally different to you. Or the words that I'm saying might not produce any picture in your head, let alone, that's just us two t- having a conversation, which of course is part of my, my dissertation. Conversation in the Hebrew Bible is that's interesting, but like conversation in general is just crazy, very complicated. Let's br- and then we bring in this other factor of the gospel, which actually has its own cultural context and story context and uh, and um, a lot of uh, things to understand, to know, but also a God to know. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's not just theory, but it's actually is a, a, a way to connect with with Jesus um, in the Holy spirit to, to God, the father. And so when we bring all these together, it can get really, really complicated just as yeah, an example, or go ahead. I was just going to say this, this gives rise, gives reason 
for theological education. That's right. To know all of these factors a little bit more informs better practice in the world. Yeah. So if we want to be extremely practical, theology plays a part. It absolutely does. Because if you don't have a good theological foundation, you don't actually, you can't be, no, you're never going to be completely sure, but you're definitely not going to be sure if the way that you are communicating the gospel to the other person is actually connecting with them in a way that is true. Yeah. So give, give us an example. Great. So one of my favorite examples is of the Moravian brothers who, uh, amazing missionary movement that actually sprung in this region where we are right now in Moravia. Uh, we are sitting right now in Ostrava, but the, the, this movement started a, a few villages away from us and, uh, and then they relocated to Herrenhut in, in, uh, in Germany. Um, and then they sent missionaries all over the world. Amazing, amazing story. One of the places that they sent missionaries was to Greenland. Uh, and when they went to Greenland, they were, they were very excited to, to share the gospel, obviously. Obviously. <laughs> but then they started doing this, the, sharing the gospel and saying things like, Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We'd all be like, hallelujah. Yes, we know what that means but there are no lambs in Greenland. <laughs> there is no corresponding picture to that word. Uh, and that meant that actually that whole sentence was now kind of devoid of meaning. It did not connect, it did not make sense, it did not communicate the, the truth and beauty of the gospel and what Jesus' sacrifice meant. So you know what they did? Tell us. They made a little, did, a, did some contextualization. <laughs> they, they substituted they a word and they thought, what is a picture that will connect with the people that I'm talking with, the, with, with these tribes in Greenland? And they asked the question, what sorts of animals do they interact with on a daily basis? Not sheep, not lambs, but seals. There were a lot of seals around. And so they contextualized that gospel statement and said, Jesus is the seal of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Brilliant. Amazing. Brilliant. <laughs> not uh, not a seal as in like a letter seal. Like, or, or, like, or. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I should, I should have you do that again, but I won't ask. <laughs> I can always rewind. Oh, yeah. So uh, a really, a re that's a great example because I've never heard the gospel presented to me in that way. And that wouldn't mean a thing to me. The seal of God. No. no. And even the fact that maybe some of our listeners heard like seal, like a stamp that also is take, you know, shows the complexity of what we're talking about. Yeah. I mean, you, you say that in the Czech Republic, people are going to think of a stamp probably, probably mm -hmm. something like a stamp. Yep. Yeah. Or you might think of like seal the singer. Oh, I mean, yeah, yes. There's so many possibilities. <laughs> so many why, possibilities. <laughs> so you have to, have to take here. that into account or even, I mean, if we take that statement a little bit further and unpack it a little bit more, even saying that, he, that, that he's the, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. People have different conceptualizations of what sin is and we have to take that into account as well. Uh, so might need to explain a little bit more in depth and in a way that connects with that person's cultural context, you know, kind of a legal, we're getting into the weeds here maybe, but like a legal understanding versus a, a communal, you know, shame context, um, might mean you have to change things a little bit, uh, that, you know, it might not connect with somebody that they've, you know, incurred wrong against God and that their ledger is, you know, full of, uh, full of marks wrong against them, mm -hmm. um, which is true, but it might not be meaningful. Uh, it might be better to say you have, you've shamed God. You've, uh, you actually have, um, you, you, you have, uh, sort of dis dishonored, his dishonored. That's, that's what I was looking for. You've dishonored God. And in, in, in doing so you've, you've brought dishonor upon you and your community as well. It could be really important to reframe things a little bit in a way that is still consistent with the gospel. Exactly. Um, but that is stated in a way that the other person can really hear and understand. Yeah. And that it's, it's not changing the gospel. The gospel is not, it's not changed in doing so. Um, no. and there's even, a. A, a, another layer deeper, I think that we can go here. Um, it, it's one thing your, your example is a great one or like to walk into a mall and say, can I have an apple? Well, it's a mall. <laughs> Are you talking about technology, a computer or, or, um, malls here in Europe anyway, not, not 
so much in other parts of the world have grocery stores. Grocery stores. So you could be saying, I, I'm hungry. Like I want an apple. I, I need to eat something. Um, but even, even beyond that, I, I think of Cyril and Methodius here mm. um, and how they went and how they contextualized the gospel uh, when they left and went to what the, roughly speaking, the part of the world that we're currently talking from right now in the Czech Republic um, and, and some surrounding area more, more broadly. They, they spoke words all the time. They, they gave liturgies, sometimes in, in, in Latin, they strove very wholeheartedly for it to be in the language of the people. Sometimes they were able to do that, sometimes not. But one thing they did that made them unique was demonstrate the gospel by doing what Jesus did. Mm. Table fellowship. Huge part of contextualizing the gospel was simply leaving the church where the, the, the what's the word? Um, the, 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 Fancy word for a pastor, a priest, priest. whatever. Yeah, fancy <laughs> word for a pastor. <laughs> I was thinking cleric. When yeah, priest is better. Um, they they don't they don't like they weren't known at the time for going to visit people. Yeah, Cyril Methodius was like, we need to get to know these people. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. they developed relationships, and they became a living embodiment of a good father, just by their presence. So they were speaking the words and, and and just the fact of what they were doing, and simply just being together with people. Like literally, their presence meant so much. It became it became a picture of God, and I'm sure that's part of the reason why. Some of the, I want to say it was more of the the in the German speaking crowd saying uh, they no people who said that they didn't like the German missionaries I think it was um, because That's they right. didn't do that but Cyril and Methodius yeah. did so it, it's helpful to understand the overall point to join God at work in the world through a person's life we can abstract this to death but the overall point is to put it back together yep. for a greater understanding so that we can join God at work in the world through interacting with people. So we're, we're, what we're after is we're about the deeper matters of the heart. So there, there's really two realms. Both are extremely important. Truth, propositional claims, and then heart, the emotions, the desires, the imagination. And if we if we do evangelism and we never tap into that, it's, it, it loses its effect. Um, we're, we're not, um, maybe, maybe our performance is a little bit off, if we can keep that metaphor going. So we, we want to appeal to the deeper matters in the person's heart. Remembering that theology, is, as you said earlier, Tyler, it's embodied and not just dealing with the realm of thinking in the brain. So with, with this and semiotics in mind, w- when people are speaking words, what we are listening for is the deeper matters in their heart. That's right. So to illustrate this, maybe, maybe mm. respond here, Tyler. Yes, Some, yes. You're sharing the gospel with somebody and they, this is a, a real life example of, uh, with me and, and some other formation students and staff in Budapest sharing the gospel. Um, we're sharing the gospel. This guy keeps talking about politics. <laughs> so if we're about the deeper matters of the heart and joining God where he's at work, yeah, we have to figure out not just, it's more than just how do I make the gospel make sense, but it's really meeting that person where they are. And first we have to figure out what's going on. Why are they, I'm not talking about politics. Why are they talking about politics so much? What, what are some potential thoughts that you have here, Tyler? Well, I'm uh, heard stories about this this interaction. It was very <laughs> interesting. Maybe you can talk a little bit more about it as well. But um, but it's uh, it's I think it's an opportunity to ask some good questions. Um, that's that's really important in this kind of relational mm-hmm. em- evangelism is to ask. Well, well, what's going on? What's the deeper? What's going on behind that statement or that question? Why does this? Why is this piece? so difficult for you or why is it so important for you? Um, I love asking questions and my, my sister, my sister kind of, uh, lovingly makes fun of me for asking questions whenever we talk like, well, what's behind She'll, she'll come to me with a question about something mm-hmm. and I'll say, I'll say, well, why, why are you asking that? <laughs> she'll be like, oh, well, that's a good question <laughs> and it allows us to go a little bit deeper. So in that, in that, in this example with the, with the man who keeps kind of, he's hearing the gospel, but it, he keeps, uh, pushing it in a different direction, pivoting, pivoting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, it's an opportunity to say, Oh, either it's either, either it's an opportunity to say, well, what's behind that? Or it's also an opportunity to reframe the gospel in the way, in the way that's going to connect with, with yes. that person. And yes. a great example of that is, um, is John chapter four, the woman at the well, mm, yeah. where, where it seems like they're, they're just talking about totally, totally different things. 
And, but Jesus is actually linking up with things that are important to the Samaritan woman and is saying, well, you know, you're coming here every day to fill up your water, but how about, how about I give you some water living that's water. living water that's, that's, uh, that's um, never going to run out. That's a very good example of that kind of contextualization and listening to the other person where they're at and using that as a springboard to talk about spiritual matters. Yeah, and for that deeper listening, that's where we have to have a good, good active presence. And we want to, it's really we're trying to embody the presence of Christ. Uh, we are not, but we are, we are carriers of his presence. And so we're trying to embody that. <laughs> um, and it's, it's possible if we have a thought, we could even say, well, maybe they're talking about politics, like figuring out the theme of what they're saying, because mm-hmm. people talk and there's always a theme, but they don't, they, they don't know it consciously. And if you draw it out, they, they, they'll start talking even more. And you're connecting with them, at, not, not just in the head, but at the, in the heart at that point. Yeah. It could be maybe they have some fear of, you know, it connects with their past somehow, whatever. Um, a loss of control or somehow have some, some sort of security that they find. You can also ask clarifying questions as well, mm-hmm. like, it, or, or, or active listening questions. Of, it sounds yeah. like you're yeah. saying this, or mm-hmm. it sounds like this piece is really important to you. Is that, is that, is that true? And you can actually help them even identify some of those pieces and then link up to them. So Sean, can you tell us maybe a little bit more about that conversation? Is there, are there any, are there any uh, interesting uh, points to that uh, interaction that are worth sharing with our listeners? Uh, yeah, there are, I think. Um, to do so concisely. Yeah. Um, you know, w- one thing that was really interesting, he, he was getting heated. Like his voice was raising and raising and raising to the point we're in this little restaurant and people are yeah. you know, looking around. <laughs> they're, they're turning their heads like what's going on. And so I thought if, if we're going to continue this discussion in a healthy way, like he's, he's a person like we want to, we want to honor him. He's, he's literally was our guest at the table and he was an interesting guest. <laughs> um, but I thought as we're leaving, I actually suggested we should pay now and leave and we can continue this discussion. And I made sure to, to find, find him and sort of walk alongside this guy as we're walking back. And I simply wanted to de-escalate the situation. And I spent um, about 10 minutes in a row saying, you know what, you're right. Yeah, to that critique that you have of this political party, I can see that. I think, I think you're right. And, and then he might say something and I say, well, sir, I, I, sir th- we mean, it, it seems like you might mean this, like, but we're actually saying this. Yes. Um, and, and spending some more time agreeing with him and finding commonality. And, and as where I was finding commonality, he just de-escalated his voice to the point where he said, and I, I've been talking a lot. Can I, can <laughs> I just have one more thing to say? I said, I'll, I'll hear one more thing that you have to say. If, if I can have one more thing to say. In <laughs> nice. And then I, I basically contextualized as much as possible in the moment, talking about it afterwards, much easier, just saying. Um, but, but basically talked about Jesus in, 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 in not political terms, but in what I thought uh, I, was, I was hearing from this guy and what his heart was longing for and crying out uh, for. And, and that's why he was placing faith in politics um, and, and trying to say, no, Jesus is the better politics in, in a way. Um, so de-escalating the situation, finding commonality was really key uh, to unlocking and being able to actually share the gospel. Um, and then again, not just saying, well, we believe Jesus died and rose and, and et cetera. I could have focused on historical data because he went there a little bit, but uh-huh, I was going back, uh-huh. like, what is the deeper desire of his heart? Yes. I think that he's longing for something and that's what I went after. I went after that deeper matter of the yeah. heart. And do I know it connected? <sighs> I'm not sure. Uh, but one of our Hungarian students got to talk with him afterwards in Hungarian. Amazing. It was great. Um, this guy speaks like 10 languages, by the way. <laughs> um, Hungarian is only one. Spoke English perfectly. Um, but the, I think overall, wh- what we're trying to do is, is listen to people. Maybe even empathy statements for those who have taken counseling courses could work. Because then you can find out you're wrong based on how a person reacts. Or if they go, oh, you get me, mm. then, then you're tapping in and you can use that to your leverage. I'm, here I am integrating everything possible at all everything times. Everything possible. <laughs> into evangelism. <laughs> um, but what we're really saying is spirit, Holy Spirit, what is this person truly talking about? Yeah. What does their heart 
want? What does their heart need? And we need to spend most of our active attention listening at the deeper level than just their words. God's after the deeper longing of the heart and transforming it. So we should be about the deeper level also. Yeah. If we establish, I think something like that, that like, like, you know, they're using political talk as a means of figuring out true freedom. It's a possibility. We can talk about the freedom that we have in Christ and use the same phrase and turn it for the gospel. Use the same word and turn it for the gospel. Clarifying meaning at all times because, you know, you could say freedom and it means something totally different in the U.S. compared to here oh, versus yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Brazil, for example, or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it we, we, can, we can use those, those types of statements to really draw out people. Um, and I, again, doing this puts the two realms of argument into perspective. The realm of truth and also the realm of the heart. We're speaking truth, and we want to speak the truth to the heart, not just to their heads. <laughs> Sometimes right. we forget, and we think, ah, see, it's a, it's a, it's a golden nugget, and we can just insert it, and it, it, it yet we can, uh, but it, there's a, there's more nuance that needs to be done in order for it to be received well. We don't want to just say stuff; we want it to actually be received. Uh, so it's very tempting sometimes to stay in the realm of words and argue for you know truth and various things. Staying there though might not be the best thing. Getting to the heart of the matter figuring out how that person might be being transformed. The spirit is, is, is at work preparing the way um, and, and trying to figure out what that is. Life transformation, you know, that's what we're after. That's by, what we're by after. a God who pursues us relentlessly on his mission, where we are just simply joining. No. Amen. You know, I'm checking our time over here. So we're on the keep it keeping on task. I, I think of at this point John Lennox as like the the poster. He's like if you were to think evangelism and apologetics, I think John Lennox. Sure. Do you know who describe yeah. for our listeners who John Lennox is, just in case people don't know? Mm, well, you'll do a better job, but I know he's like a super smart dude. He's actually, a, he, he's a mathematician. That's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. I knew he was like a science, like a science guy. So really, really smart. Very good debater. Oxford. Yes, yes. Oxford. Written lots of books. Very uh, intellectually sound, thoughtful, gospel focused. Yeah. And if, if, if we can land the, land the, the plane for this episode... He's it. Yeah. Like he, he's a perfect embodiment of it. And there's a, let me, let me find, there's a, um, a podcast, another podcast. Uh, it's called Unbelievable. We'll, we'll put the link, uh, the, at least the title uh, of the podcast. It's by Justin Brierly, And he facilitates discussions with people who disagree with each other. Yep. So oftentimes with a Christian or an atheist. And he did one, at a, it was live on a college campus. Something about natural, na, um, something about science and God. Uh, I forget the exact um, it was with Peter Atkins. Um, he's an atheist, maybe not one of the more famous ones, but he has a lot of, a lot of arguments, a lot of books he's written on this. And he has, um, Justin Brierley facilitates this debate with John Lennox and, and Peter Atkins. We'll put the YouTube link, just watch that debate. The first, like even just the first 10 minutes, you'll see everything that we've talked about on display. Hmm. From John Lennox, he he's he's very propositional, and he turns at one point when he's is like ten to fourteen minutes into this hour and a half debate, I think, he turns a phrase and says, uh, "Well, if it's this, this, and this, then it can't be this." And then he laughs and says, "Well, maybe it's a little bit too early in the evening for this kind of you know for this kind of logic." <laughs> he turns something very quickly on a phrase, yeah. laughs about it, but his entire demeanor his his demeanor is not defensive. He's just having a conversation, and Peter Atkins is like rigid and like mm. proving his point. And John Lennox is like, no, nah, I'm, I'm bearing witness testimony to Christ and I can chill. I can chill. <laughs> like, and, and he, he clarifies terms a lot. Mm -hmm. He says, well, when you say this, you're actually talking about not science. You're talking about natural science. And here's why that matters. X, Y, Z. But the whole time, and he concludes, he shares the gospel in the end. Hmm. And the whole time he builds Peter Atkins up and says, you should go read his books. You know, I've read his books. They're wow. wonderful. Um, so he's always looking to affirm the other person and just like, wow. And especially in a debate, you know, you're thinking debate, but John Lennox is thinking 
No, I'm, 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 I'm about that deeper, deeper kind of active listening. And just his presence in the room is, is a type of missional presence through his demeanor and through his words. So, so good. So really, good. I really commend him. Uh, and anybody that you would commend for this idea of a missional style relational evangelism? Nobody comes straight to mind that you could watch on YouTube, but I know lots of guys right. here in Central and Eastern Europe who do that. Yes. So yes. they're not going to be famous on YouTube, but uh, there are people who, who live this out on a daily basis. For sure. That's what we're all striving to do and what yeah. we're, we're praying for, for those of you who are listening to, to do as well. So theology of mission leads, a biblical theology of mission leads to holiness on mission. Character backed by good doctrine. I borrow these words from Titus, uh, the book of Titus. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. And then this, this produces good works. So character backed by good doctrine produces good works. That's just that a missional presence wrapped up in the evangelism mode. Yeah. Uh, so we, we participate in God's mission by engaging in evangelism that's fully embodied and remembering that other people are fully embodied people <laughs> as well, even if we disagree with their viewpoint of something. Absolutely. We attract people like the Israelites with our holy service. And we proclaim his goodness in Matthew 28, great commission. I did it right that time. Good I job. <laughs> in, in, in great commission fashion by taking our holy service into the world as the basis of our engagement with people. Any final thoughts you have, Tyler? I'm good. Let's land the plane. Let's do it. Thank you for listening. That, that's how we'll end. Thank you for listening today and be sure to hit that like button and subscribe. And if you've done both of those things, Ooh. we thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm speaking again to oh, yes. you pointing at the camera here. Hello. And one of the best things that you can do, not just because we want to be flattered, we don't, but so other people can find this podcast is for you to write a review. So I, I somebody, somebody very, very recently told me your podcast is dope. So it means uh, what, really cool. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And, and useful. Um, if, if you think that, write, write a review. And, and maybe you don't have to use the word dope. Um, but, but write a review because that would be really helpful for us um, to be able to, you know, if you write a review, we'll probably feature you on the, on the podcast. Oh, here we go. Uh, we'll, we'll be able to share and other people can find us better. So we thank you for listening. And, and praise God who has cleansed us by his blood, enabling us to receive the Holy Spirit to live holy lives in his presence so that we can be carriers of his presence to others with uh, uh, missional evangelism. So go in the blessings of Christ. I'm um, thinking Ephesians 1, 3 to 14, I think it is. And think biblically, reflect theologically, and act missionally like Jesus. <laughs> See you next time. <laughs> See you next time.